tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome to Quick Charge. It's October 9th, 2025, and I'm your host, Joe Boris. The big story for today's show is such a deal. There you see the original equipment standard NAX port on the all-new Chevy Bolt. It's the same package, new battery, low $29,000 price. This was unveiled yesterday in California Universal Studios. Our own Jamie Dow was there. He got to experience it firsthand, and it is super cool. If you're a fan of the original Bolt, you're going to love this one. The front fascia is slightly modified from the old EUV with a black line between the headlights and no black border around the fake grille. The rear has different tail lights placed higher up, a big demand from Bolt owners, and slightly more paint on the bumper. That's about it from the exterior physical differences. We kind of knew that already having seen it in public last week, but now we're getting more information on the interior inspect. The juicy updates we're hoping to get the freshly unveiled 2026 Chevy Bolt returns, riding in on GM's outstanding Ultium battery. The compact Bolt offers 150 kilowatt charging for sub 30 minute, 10 to 80% pit stops. Looks like 25, 26 minutes right in there. 255 miles of GM estimated EPA range, a native NAX or Tesla supercharger connection, Super Cruise ADAS as an option, and again, that sub-$30,000 price tag, and crucially, bi-directional vehicle-to-home, vehicle-to-grid capability if you're using GM's home products. Again, Jamie Dow has a full article about this. Definitely worth checking out. We've got the link here. We'll have it in the show notes at electrek.co. Today's episode is brought to you by Climate Exchange. They're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working to help states pass effective, equitable climate policies, which are critical in accelerating the transition to a zero emission economy. This nonprofit has recently kicked off its 10th annual EV raffle, where participants have multiple opportunities to win their dream EV. This time around, Climate Exchange is shaking things up with not one, but two raffles. First is the luxury raffle. That's the one that they've been doing for the last 10 years. The grand prize winner can choose any EV or any two EVs fully customized up to $120,000 limit. New this year is the mini raffle in which the grand prize winner can choose any EV on the market priced up to $45,000. Luxury raffle tickets are $250 each and only 5,000 will be sold, while mini raffle tickets are 100 each and the Climate Exchange is only selling 3,500 tickets. That makes your chances of winning your dream EV higher than other raffles and all of it goes to support a great cause getting rid of air pollution decarbonizing improving air quality that's something that goes beyond politics and it gets even better if you purchase a ticket to the luxury raffle by october 30th you'll be automatically entered into their bonus early bird drawing for ten thousand dollars on october 31st halloween the grand prize drawings will take place december 12th but we recommend getting those early bird raffle tickets now to give yourself the most chances to win visit carbonraffle.org slash electric to learn more again we're going to have that in the show notes and to remind our viewers who are checking this out on youtube of the raffle going on in the bottom right hand corner you're going to be able to see a bunch of these sample raffle tickets, give you a good sense of what those look like. Now, we talked about the new Chevy Bolt, which is the most affordable new EV in the U.S. We're going to go to the other extreme. We're talking about Ferrari. Ferrari reveals the specs of its first all-electric car, the Electrica. They flew out our own resident Tesla expert, Fred Lambert, all the way from Canada to Italy to check this thing out. And of course, the giant elephant in the room, no They did not show Fred what the car looks like. What they did give him, though, was a whole, whole bunch of specs. I'm not going to sit here and read these out to you. Go to Fred's article, check out the show notes, click the link, and he's got the full rundown. I will give you a little bit of summary here. Fred's big takeaway from the event was that Ferrari was becoming a complete electric automaker. Remarkable thing to say about a brand that built its reputation around a V12 engine. It's not buying its electric powertrain and integrating it into the vehicle with a Ferrari-tuned chassis, however. Numerous automakers have gone that route, and there are ways to make it interesting, but Vigna made it clear that Ferrari wants to use its own EV technology and advance with its own innovation. The Italian automaker has developed and is producing almost the entire powertrain. Ferrari is purchasing the NMC pouch cells from Korea's SK. I even saw the battery cell crates with SK logos lying around the factory and then makes the entire battery module and pack on its own from there. The automaker explained, quote, the layout of the cells is designed to minimize inertia 
inertia and lower the center of gravity, placing them where possible behind the driver's seat. 85% of the weight of the modules is situated below the floor pan, while the remainder is located under the rear seat, a solution that made it possible to shorten the wheelbase and minimize inertia to maximize driving pleasure in all situations with an optimal weight distribution of 4753, and apparently there are back seats. During presentations related to the pack and modules, several engineers mentioned making the Electrica a forever EV by utilizing battery modules that are easy to service and replace. That's something we're starting to see more and more, even from lower end vehicles like the Toyota Prius and the Nissan Leaf. There's whole little cottage industry for uh, refurbishing those batteries and recycling those batteries. You can get a look at Ferrari's own electric motors there. Lots of Formula One tech in that. Definitely go over and check out Fred's article. Another new interesting fact about that Ferrari, it is not going to make fake engine noise for its first EV. That's one of the many big mistakes that Dodge made with its Charger Daytona, having it make that stupid fret sonic fart sound. But uh, hey, that's just my opinion. I think it's ridiculous. Totally embarrassing. Nobody should ever buy one of those chargers. And uh, having said that, now I'm probably going to end up buying one. That seems to be how my life works out. Now, that said, Ferrari's solution to creating a sound is a novel one. The company is focusing on what it calls an authentic voice unique to the electric engine. Fred attended Ferrari's Tech Day for the Electrica yesterday, and Antonio Palermo, the brand's head of NVH and sound quality, gave an excellent presentation about how the company approached the problem. He said there was a lot of internal debate at Ferrari about how to manage the powertrain. It took us a long time to reach a consensus about what sound to get, but it was clear that we wanted something authentic. Again, the problem with being authentic with an EV is that if the powertrain and packaging team did their job right, there's precious little sound to play with at all. An electric guitar-inspired Palermo solution, unlike an acoustic guitar, an electric drive unit doesn't have a hollow body or sound hole to convert the string vibrations into audible sound. And much like an electric guitar, Ferrari's solution involves capturing and amplifying the actual vibrations of the drivetrain components. The automaker explained, quote, a high precision sensor installed on the rear axle picks up the frequencies of the powertrain, which are amplified and projected into the surroundings as with an electric guitar. The sensor used is an accelerometer installed at a very rigid point on the inverter casting. You can check out Fred's article for that as well. He goes into more details. Really, really exciting stuff. Now, again, today's show is all about extremes on the complete opposite extreme of a Ferrari is something a little more similar to Ferrari's current Formula One car in the fact that it is a giant slow-moving tractor. The world's first autonomous hydrogen farm tractor made its debut in Kubota Orange this past week. The Japanese equipment giant pulled the wrap off its new autonomous tractor. They pack electric drive motors into the wheels and power them with a hydrogen fuel cell, crucially one that can get topped off with hydrogen made from farm waste. The company has high hopes for its electric farm equipment as Japan, like other Western nations, is struggling to attract young people into farming, leading to a continually aging and shrinking workforce among ongoing labor shortages. Quote, the concept behind this model is to simultaneously achieve environmental stability, operational efficiency, and labor savings. That's according to the official press copy from Kubota. Since only water is discharged during operation, it is environmentally friendly and also designed for operation without operators via onboard autonomous driving and remote control. Now, you've heard all of that before, kids. Nothing new there. That's what all the hydrogen people say. What is different about this, because it's on a farm, is the notion that hydrogen can be produced locally by the farmers themselves. Many kinds of farmers use existing farm inputs that convert bio waste into methane, which can then be used to reform or electrolyze hydrogen. That circular energy model gives farmers in areas with limited grid access or a desire to stay off the grid for their own reasons a viable way to generate and store that energy. Energy that, unlike the electricity gleaned from solar panels, can power modified reciprocating engines like Cummins' new X15 diesel or a number of existing Volvo Penta engines. You can see that X15 right there. That is an engine that can run on natural gas diesel or hydrogen with minimal modifications really really clever tech that is out there and that gives people who are buying these machines they're looking at a 20 30 year lifetime a big sense of security that no matter what the future of fuel looks like they will be able to power that vehicle again volvo penta does something similar so this is an idea that's out there 
it plays up this idea of a messy middle where we don't really know where it's going. We know where it's going. It's going to batteries. But uh, hey, if all you do is listen to Fox News, you may not realize that the EVs have already won. And uh, that's okay. You know, the market will decide and the market will show you that we have been right all along. But if you do any research at all into farming and agriculture as a whole, you will be shocked by the age of farmers and the age of their equipment too. The industry is packed with combustion engines, people fearful of big corporations taking their data and of big government cutting off their fuel supplies. However, ironic that may seem to some, to them and to the heavy machines that are already too heavy to work in rain and mud, in some cases, a relatively lightweight on-site energy solution might be a welcome thing, uh, you know, again, until they realize that uh, solar and batteries can do the job, especially with a hot swappable battery that doesn't require massive massive amounts of energy that's all we've got for today october 9th be sure to check out that climate exchange at carbon raffle slash electric again we'll have a link to that in the show notes like and subscribe for more and uh you know we didn't even talk about tesla today so we'll complain a whole bunch about tesla tomorrow